Luke chapter 2, uh, verse 8, kind of puts uh, the stories from the stable in perspective with this little statement. It says, And she, Mary, gave birth to her firstborn son. Uh, she wrapped him in cloths, uh, and she laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. That little uh, snapshot of uh, what happened when Christ was born tells you uh, that something unusual was going on and that Christ was born probably in a stable because she, they talk about a manger, and a manger is what they fed animals from. And so we're making a deduction uh, because we are analytical people that it's probably a stable out back of the inn. That's where Christ was born. Very interesting. You have to ask yourself if that's where he was and he's in a stable, as it were, and he's born in a manger with straw, etc. cetera. I wonder what animals were there. Because God's totally providential. He, nothing just happens by accident. This is the smallest little things. Uh, God works in and through those things. Uh, and so we must ask, you know, I'm, I wonder which animals were there. Uh, and so I've, I've uh, gone out on a limb and said, well, you know, for me, uh, traveling to Israel, taking people there for years, uh, you know, I've seen all kinds of animals there. And I've gone to uh, farms full of animals there as well to sh show tour groups. Uh, there, there had to be a donkey there. I mean, that was transportation back in the day. Uh, and, and there must have been a, been a goat, uh, as it were, because they were prolific, uh, especially in that day and time. And we learned about the donkey last week. Uh, uh, it was an unusual story, Numbers 22 to 24. Uh, just by way of review, I'm going to assume you're all new, uh, or, or you've forgotten what we talked about last week. We talked about a donkey, did we not? And who was riding on that donkey? What was his name? Balaam. Balaam. And he was a Gentile. He was a soothsayer. He was a wizard. Uh, he was hired by the king of uh, Moab to curse the Israelites. There were four uh, curse oracles, and of those four curse oracles, everyone was turned around. Every time the prophet opened his mouth, he wasn't really a prophet. He really, he's not even called as such in the, in the Torah. But, um, but as he speaks forth a word of, of curse against Israel, out comes wonderful words of blessing to Israel, and then amazing prophecies, very exact prophecies. And chapter 24 is the one that we uh, culminated our study with last week, that he uh, prophesied the coming of a, of a star, to Israel, an ultimate ruler, and says he's going to have a scepter. He's, he's prophesying that the ultimate Davidic king, the ultimate Messiah. And when we see uh, Christ born, it is the, the Magi that follow the star, uh, the divinely ordained. It wasn't really a star per se, it was in my estimation a break within dimensionality showing God's Shekinah glory into our cosmos. Because if you study the star, it does unusual things that stars don't do. But they followed that, that glorious. Uh, um, image of us what looked like a star to them to the the to the christ who was the star and so with that great specificity what was prophesied by uh um uh, balaam uh concerning the coming of the messiah was fulfilled when he arrived in 5 bc that's what makes christianity different than all other world religions it's very specific in its prophetic value in fact if you were looking at all the holy books of the world and would want to know how would i know from all of these um which one was the one well, for me personally, I'd be looking at prophetic value. Did God speak? And how could he speak and validate it other than by giving you a word of the future, which he would have to know by God, definition of who he is, omniscient of all things. And he, he was the only one who would be able to tell us with specificity uh, who's coming. I mean, imagine the prophecies about Christ, the city that he was born in. Bethlehem prophesied around the 7th century, prophet Micah, etc. Uh, a tribe he was born to. Judah, you know, etc. I mean, on and on and on go the prophecies. And so if you like mathematics, uh, this is for thinking people because Balaam gave us a great prophecy that we need to remember the value of it. Um, there's a mathematician. Uh, his name is Marvin uh, Bedinger. He sold 12 million books on math. That's amazing. I didn't know that they were such hot sellers. People, <laughs> they probably mostly sold around here, right? Um, people love math. And so he, he wrote a math book, and he's a Christian as well. And so he's a thinking person. So he just wanted to put his statistical abilities together to, to ascertain the answer to the question, what would be the probability that Christ, who had 60 prophecies to fulfill, that he could not control the variables of the particular prophecies, what would be the value of him fulfilling just nine of the 60? Here's what the mathematician, the bestseller, had to say, quote, so let's take a domed football stadium um, of average size and empty it of everything, stands, seats, lockers, etc. Then proceed to fill the remaining space with grains of white sand, except for one little grain of sand. He says that you mark with red. He says, uh, what would be the odds of you selecting the same grain out of that whole stadium four times in a row when they send you in? <laughs> You're thinking people, aren't you? <laughs> right. Who's going to bet on that one? That's not happening. You're going to get quite old. Sitting there, got to go back in. you kidding me. To find that four times in a row, it's not happening. You know how many pieces of sand are in there? Well, he says it's 
uh, one in 10 to the 76th power is a probability that that would ever happen. Point is, it would never happen. And this not only just God fulfilling nine prophecies when he came, he fulfilled 60. If you ever say you lack evidence and reasons to believe in God, I submit to you that mathematical equation. Because when Balaam prophesied, he said, I see the star coming, the king is coming. And he's coming, and he came exactly as prophesied. Talk about evidence to believe. If you're not a Christian today, I submit to you evidence to consider because it's major evidence that leads to a relationship with God. But that's all about the donkey. That's all review. We want to get on with the goat. Goat. You've seen a goat? You know what they look like? Droopy ears, wiry hair. They have an odor about them. Um, they always scared me as a child, you know? When I'm the first one that I saw, I'm like, He's weird looking. I mean, the eyes kind of offset at the top of the head. I'm thinking as a kid, why didn't God just like move him down, you know? Um, but not that I would argue with God at nine, but it's just thoughts I had as a child, you know? And you get too close to the, to the pin where they are, and I'm looking at this goat, and I'm feeling my clothing going this direction, and he's like gobbling my shirt. I'm like, what in the world? I mean, they're unbelievable, are they not? You've seen them? Yeah. Well, get the American kind of goat out of your mind because it's, it's probable, and this is not ironclad, but it's probable based on goats I've seen in Israel that th this was maybe a Nubian ibex, an ibex, an ibex. Here's a picture that I took uh, in uh, the wilderness of uh, Jerusalem, uh, Judea. What's the noise you're making? Are any guys making that noise? <laughs> just wondering. Yeah, it's like, I don't know what's up with my wife, man. I mean, it's just a little thing. Yeah, 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 it's a, it's a little Ibex. Now, when you go with me, if you go with me to Israel, next time I go when I fish, finish my doctorate in apologetics in about a year and a half, um, we'll go back again, and we'll, we'll go down to the Dead Sea, and you'll see these little things. They're everywhere. They're everywhere, and they, they're kind of skittish. You can't re get really close to them, so I took this with a telephoto lens. Uh, they're, they're all over the place, and you'll, you'll go in these canyons that are like vertical cliffs, and you'll look up, and you'll see them on the side of a cliff that looks vertical, and you're thinking to yourself, run for cover. I mean... <laughs> They're going to fall, or they're going to kick off some rocks or something. They're standing where no one could stand. And they're just looking at you. Uh, their little cloven foot o opens up uh, like a pad, and they can just stand on the smallest little piece of, they're totally nimble. And they are, as many would say, as you look at that picture, cute. 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 They, they're cute. They're adorable. Now, the male versions grow horns and everything, and, and, uh, and they change their demeanor, you know. But uh, this is what they look like when they're little babies. Now, this is probably what we're talking about. We're talking about a goat. I'm not going to go to the wall for that. I submit it as it's, it's possible because I had somebody in last service that raises goats for a living. This is an interesting church. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I got a great education on goatology uh, between the last two services. But back to my, I don't know if that's a term, but it sounds good, doesn't it? Um, so we got to think about it. If, if, when you look at a goat in the Old Testament, where do you find them appearing? All over the place, but you find them wrapped around the, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. In fact, it is the essence of Yom Kippur, the day of national cleansing of sin. Uh, the Jews called the Day of Yom Kippur Shabbat, the Sabbath, Shabbaton, the Sabbath of Sabbaths. Translated, there is no greater day in their calendar than this one. This is the day that God washes us clean nationally of our sin. That's why they call it the Sabbath of Sabbaths. The Day of Atonement, of coverage animal that was used for the day of coverage well you guessed it it was a goat not a lamb it was a goat in fact it's more than one goat it's two goats as we're going to see and when we look at this we must ask a simple question here's my question that i'll pose to you this morning as we look at stories from the stable what the little goat see i mean what that little goat see in the moonlight as he saw that little baby born in that, that stone trough that had been carved out with the hay and heard that little baby crying, who did that goat see? And if that goat could speak, what would the goat say that his lineage uh, had endured until the coming of that one? Well, we want to analyze that from the, the day of Yom Kippur um, as God uses a goat to teach us much uh, about that goat that points to Christ, the ultimate uh, goat, as it were. And I know this is hard to shift your, 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 your worldview and your thinking of things because we tend to think of Jesus as the Lamb of God. Indeed, he's called that, but he's also called the goat when you think about Yom Kippur. What did that little goat see? A couple things. Number one, that, got, that, one, that little goat that evening saw the, the one who followed protocol. I use protocol because we all understand protocol, don't we? Especially here. Protocol. What is protocol? How we do things. 
If you, if you command people, if you manage people, you have protocol. You probably have standard operating procedures, manuals of this stuff. This is how we do things. Do you as a leader, an officer, a manager, do you love deviation from those underneath you? I just thought we'd modify this. Uh, you know, I know this is not what you want, but we're modif- Do you like modification? No, no one likes modification in your leadership. Do you love creativity? Even if the person says, well, I was totally sincere when I modified. Does sincerity help? Uh, no, no. So just take where you're at and just apply it to God. Apply it to God. What did the little goat see? He saw one who followed protocol. Verse 1 of Leviticus 16. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Their names, Nadab and Abihu. When did they die? Uh, well, you, you got to go back to Leviticus 10. So after they died, God spoke to Moses and said, talk to Aaron. Um, when they approached the presence of the Lord, those two sons, they died on that day at church. Whoa. Imagine. How was church today? I lost my two sons. Why? Uh, the Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time, can't come into my presence whenever you want to, into the holy place, the holy holies, inside the veil where the holy holies is, before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, or if he does this whenever he wants to, he'll die. You can only come into my presence, God says, in the holy of holies, one time a year on my terms by how I tell you protocol. And if you don't do that, just like I took your two sons out who didn't follow protocol, I will take you out as the high priest. For I will appear in a cloud, God says, over the mercy seat. So when you come in there one time a year, expect to see the Ark of the Covenant, the cherubim with their wings outstretched over the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat over the golden uh, ark, uh, and a cloud bank hovering over that. I'm in the cloud bank, in the, in the darkness there. Ominous. Now, Aaron's two sons were vaporized by God back in Le- Le- Leviticus chapter 10, for one reason and one reason only. Go back and read it. They were taking fire from the altar to make incense to take it into the, uh, the holy place outside the veil of the, of the holy of holies. And they brought what is called in the NIV unauthorized fire. Or the King, New King James says they brought strange fire. Or the NAS version, New American Standard says they brought profane fire. Kind of makes you ask the simple question. It, isn't fire fire? And you know what I'm saying? I mean, thinking minds want to know. I lit a fire on my fireplace last night. Maybe you had one. If we compared fire, is mine the same as yours? Well, you know, this is an army household. It's totally qualitative. It'll be different. Or maybe it's a Navy fire. I mean, but fire is fire, is it not? And all of a sudden, God says, I took out the sons of Aaron because they brought the wrong fire. What's this tell you about God? If he tells you, do this, never deviate, never deviate. Protocol is very important to God to get into his presence. He took out the sons of Nadab and Abihu, uh, sons of Aaron, uh, vaporized them. Go back. They just, boom, lightning came down from the sky. Boom, they're gone. And everybody stood there in awe at what God had just done. He had just made a major statement. It matters greatly how you do things when you try to approach me. No deviation, no modification, no creativity. Don't care how sincere you are. There is a way to do things to get into my presence. There is a way not to do things. We in the West have a really hard time with this one because we are free. (laughs) We love that word, Ah, free spirit. Free spirits in the Old Testament period got vaporized. (laughs) Now, they dared to approach the holy presence of God by bringing fire probably from home. I mean, think about how the conversation probably went. You can interview him when you get to heaven with all your questions for God. Hey, Nadab and Abihu, can we talk? What did you guys do? Well, hey, after several years of bringing the fire from the altar of God, and God started the fire in the first altar for sacrifice, we got tired of doing that. So we had a conversation as brothers and thought, we'll just bring some fire from home. I mean, fire is fire. And we'll just be progressive and creative. We're sincere in our worship. Surely God will accept our new fire. They found out, uh, no, no, no. It matters greatly how you approach God's presence. They didn't follow protocol. So God says, we're going to start Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, first and primary purposes and secondary purposes to cleanse the entire complex of sin brought in by the priests who have sin about them. But the primary purpose was because God didn't want to take two priests again out because they did something sinful. So he says, remember, follow this protocol. Jesus, conversely, as the high priest, greater than Aaron, he never deviated from protocol. Never, never, never deviated from protocol. Matthew chapter five, verse 18 says that he came to fulfill the smallest jot and tittle of the law. Smallest little letter 
uh, in the Hebrew alphabet, if you go through the alphabet, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zion, the whole alphabet, when you get to the letter Yod, it's just like a little comma. <laughs> you know, it's easy to make when you start learning how to write in Hebrew. Just, just, it's like a comma. But then if you look at the, the resh, an R, and a, and a Dalet, a D, the only difference is the, the Dalet D has a little tiny tail next to it that separates a D from a, an R. And Jesus said in Matthew 5, 18, I came to fulfill the law, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, like a yod, a Y, and the smallest move of a pin that separates a resh, an R, from a dal, a D, the little tail. He never deviated. We find in the book of Philippians, uh, uh, that little baby born in Bethlehem that was born in that manger, Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 says, In being found in appearance as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, comma, what kind of death? Even death on a cross. Who would ever pick that? If you read uh, Hegel's book on uh, crucifixion, great read, gives you great insight into Roman crucifixion, no one would ever choose that as the way to go. But God said, I'm going to send my son, he's going to be the Messiah, he's going to die for the sins of the world, and he's going to be the ultimate Yom Kippur sacrifice, uh, and he will not deviate from what I'm calling him to do. He will only do the will of the Father. What does Yom Kippur show? Well, that that little goat came, but he was also the high priest of all high priests. And he came and he died for our sins. He did what no priest could ever do. And he followed protocol perfectly because he's the God man. No sin about him. Number two, the other thing that little goat saw was a, a high priest who needed no cleansing from sin. Logically follows. He needed no cleansing from sin. Uh, verses 1 to 10 of Leviticus 16 give you the general overview of the Day of Atonement. Verses 11 to 34 give specific sequential detail. So, introduction, general, specificity, 11 and following. Uh, what, did, what, what did we see here? God wanted to cleanse the high priest from his sin, sins so that he could in turn offer sacrifice to cleanse the people of their sins and in that order because God wanted a relationship with mankind but it had to be on his terms and you had to follow his protocol. Interesting, verse three says, generally speaking, Aaron shall enter the holy place with this. This is protocol. What's he supposed to bring as the high priest to deal with his sin? What's God say? Bring a bull, a big one. It, uh, what's it for? Sin offering, okay? Uh, and bring a ram for a burnt offering. And he shall put, now notice that what he tells him protocol-wise. He shall put on, the high priest shall put on a holy a linen tunic, and the linen undergarments shall be next to his body. He shall be girded with the linen sash and attired with the linen turban. He, parenthetically, he says these are holy garments. Then he shall bathe his body in water and then put on these garments. Verse 6. Then Aaron shall offer the bull for the sin offering, which is for himself, that he may make, make atonement for himself and for his household. Don't you find this interesting? God tells him, I want you to be cleansed on the day of atonement as the high priest to come into the Holy of Holies, but you must do it based on exactly how I tell you. Imagine if Aaron said, you know, Lord, I've been thinking about that linen clothing stuff. I've been using it for years. I'm kind of getting tired of it. I think I'm going to modify it. I think I'm wearing cotton, something else. What would happen? Well, he knows what would happen. He'd get vaporized by the holiness of God. No deviation, linen guard, not your fancy priestly clothes. This is the trimmed down humble version. Bring these, no deviation. And make sure also God tells him, I just find this interesting, take a bath. That's literally what he tells him. Don't you find this interesting? What's God worried about? Sin. It's, it's, it's unsanitary. I mean, make sure that you are washed clean if things might contaminate you and then put on the right clothing, bring the right sacrifice and you can get into my presence. We have no clue as to what this is all about because our view of sin is low. God's view of sin is high. See, he sees sin as a contaminant. For us, it's like, hey, it's, you know, it's only in this private part of my life here. Don't worry, I'm a public figure. It doesn't affect the rest of my life. Do you believe that? If you have compromise and sin over here, you better well believe it affects everything else that you do. So God says, you as the high priest must get, must get cleansed, and this is all for making atonement for you. And what's atonement mean? Covering something by God's prescribed means to appease his anger. He's holy. You're sinful. You offer the right sacrifice that covers that sin. What did he have to do to cover his sin? Well, verse 11, Aaron shall offer the bull offering and the sin offering, which is for himself to make atonement for himself and his household. He'll slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. He'll take a fire pan full of clothes from the altar, which is before the Lord. Uh, and two, what does it say? Colt. Colt. What did I say? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not perfect. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, he shall take a fire pan full of, uh, it says in my text, coals, a fire, uh, from the altar for, before the Lord, and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense, and he'll bring that inside the veil. He'll put incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is, that's on the ark of the testimony. Otherwise, he'll die. Um, if you're in the military, you understand the terminology pop smoke. I mean, what are you popping smoke for? This is how Pastor Michael leaves every day when he goes home at the end of the day. I had to get used to this. He, when he's leaving, he tells me, well, it's the end of the day. I'm popping smoke. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> Yeah, what is the purpose of popping smoke? Well, there's several reasons, but part of it, from what I know of my friends that served in Vietnam, you're popping smoke in a landing zone to shield yourself so they can't see you jumping on the Huey, as it were, you know? So when you think about this, what is, how does this relate to God? He tells the high priest, when you come into my presence, make sure you have this incense really smoky when you open up that veil, because when you come in here, I'm, I'm over the mercy seat in the, in the cloudy bank there, but it must be really cloudy before you come into my presence. Why? Because if he sees God, he dies. God says, I want you to have a lot of protection when you're near my holiness. You come in and make sure there's a cloud bank when you come in. Aaron couldn't deviate as he entered the Holy of Holies because he's approaching the presence of God. He had to make sure his sin was covered, but Jesus never had to do that. That's what the little goat saw. He saw the one, the high priest who had now arrived, who had no sin about him and never needed the coverage. Notice what it says in the book of Hebrews chapter four. It says, I love this, verse 16. Let us as believers, therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. The key word there, the, trend, the pivotal word is confidence. Do you think that the high priest, when he walked into the presence of God, knowing my two sons were vaporized because they were creative in how they approached God, do you think that they went in there just totally confident? Well, we know they weren't confident, like what we, we can be confident now as believers, because they tied a rope to his ankle. What's a rope for? <laughs> he dies in there. No extraction team is coming. <laughs> He's in there. Yeah, I mean, we saw the flash of lightning. It's go He's gone, you know? I mean, they're, they're not going in there. So they had the rope uh, from sources that said they would, you know, they would pull his body out because God's holiness had taken him out because he didn't have proper coverage for sin. But it says we as believers because of the work of Christ, the greater high priest, I love that word, we can confidently go before the throne of grace. Why? Because my sin is covered by the blood of Christ. The, the, the amazing high priest who also became my sacrifice, my blood, his blood is applied to my life. So when I go to him in prayer, I don't have to like worry. I don't have to duck. I don't have to think something. I don't have to, I don't have to take the incense burn and create the smoke shield and everything. I can walk confidently. And then you wonder like, how much time do I really spend confidently walking into his presence? This is a great privilege. They got to do it once a year. You can do it when? Never. Right now, sitting in your chair. Uh, you can do it after the service. You can do it this afternoon. Whenever you want, by the work of the little baby born and placed in that manger, Christ, the greater high priest. And lastly, the goat saw the final goat who would provide total cleansing from sin. That's who he saw. Verse seven, it says, he shall take the high priest after he cleanses his sin. He shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Here's a picture of the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, in case you haven't seen it lately. He'll take uh, two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tent of meeting. So the, the, the curtain uh, right there as you see it. And Aaron shall cast two lot, uh, lots for the two goats, one for the Lord uh, and the other lot for the scapegoat. Uh, and then Aaron shall offer uh, the goat on which the lot of the Lord fell and he'll make it a sin offering, verse 15. Uh, then he'll take the, the other one, he'll slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people and he'll bring its blood inside the veil, that first goat, and he'll do with it its blood, as he did with the blood of the bull for himself, he'll sprinkle it on the mercy seat and on the front of the mercy seat, and, it, and he did it for himself seven times, so therefore he must do it for himself seven times. Imagine if he got creative and said, I think I'm going for six times. Good idea? No. How about eight? He'd never make it to eight. See, God says, no, seven times for perfection to show that I've cleansed you of your sin. Uh, he will make atonement for the holy place because it, it's been contaminated by the priests bringing their sin in there uh, because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of the transgressions uh, in regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of meaning which uh, abides with them in the midst of the impurities. And when he goes in to make atonement for the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meaning until he comes out. 
like I said, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel, he must follow the proper protocol and bring the right sacrifice, first for himself and then for the, for the people. How many times did the high priest on Yom Kippur go into the Holy of Holies? Two times, two times. Once for himself and then once for the people to obtain atonement, coverage for sin. When I was uh, uh, taking care of my mother-in-law's uh, house, getting ready for it to sell when we thought she was gonna pass away, uh, when we were out there uh, in October, uh, the, you know, the, the termite people came and did an ha- analysis and said, you got all kinds of rot, you need to fix this, termite damage here, there. So I, that's all I did all, all week I was out there. All day, that's all I did. It was a chisel, carving it out, and, and I was floating it out with Bondo. Because that's how I was trained, by a guy I knew who was a handyman. It works great. But Bondo, if you have a conversation with somebody and you got Bondo, uh, it, it's over. <laughs> you know, you got to remix it. You got to move fast. So I was over my head trying to fix all this decay and everything. Uh, and it, Bondo kept setting up on me and it's getting globby. And then I had to sand it all down. It was a huge job. And then the professional painter came. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm fixing the, the dry rot, you know, and the, and the termite damage with uh, Bondo. He goes, whatever for? I go, this is all I know. He goes, have you considered this product? So he handed me this can and there's a powder in there. He said, just kind of mix it up, just kind of like, you know, you're making pancake batter. And then uh, you just take a spatula and just slap that up there. Uh, and uh, it, you won't need to sand it much. It floats in really nice. It won't dry fast on you. And it becomes like stone. I'm like, cool. Yeah. And so I bought me a can of that and then another can, a multiple can. I cans everywhere. I kept using it and mixing it and putting it over the decay to stop the decay. And is this not like atonement? What stops the decay? The right thing. I filled it in and it was like, when I was sanding it and painting it, you couldn't even tell. It was like new. See, this is atonement. It, it's the right thing to cover sin. What's God say? What's his product? It's called the right sacrifice. It was a little, it was a little goat, a little goat. In fact, it was two. The high priest's uh, goals were to cleanse the entire complex, cleanse the people. Verse 18, he says he went out to the altar that is before the Lord, Lord to make atonement for it. And he, he took some of the blood of the bull and of the goat, put it on the horns of the altar on all sides, all four sides to make complete cleansing. With his finger, he shall sprinkle some of the blood at seven times and cleanse it from the impurities of the sons of Israel to consecrate it because our sin contaminates things. Verse 20, when he finishes atoning for the holy place of the tent of meeting and the altar, he'll offer the live goat, the second one. Then Aaron will lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and do what? Confess all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. He'll lay them on the head of the goat. He'll send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands ready. The goat shall bear on itself all the iniquities to a solitary land, and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. He had two goats. The first goat was sacrificed. The blood covered the sin of the people. The second goat, what did he do to it? He put his hands on that goat. He's the high priest. What did he say? Oh, Lord, we are a sinful people. I know as the high priest, and I confess our sin. And he begins to confess his sin. What does God do? He takes the sin of the nation and and, and places it on the, the head of that little goat. And then when they send that goat out into the wilderness, it's an illustration that all your sin has been carried away. And how did you get your sin carried away? You came the right way to God, brought the right sacrifice that illustrated sin was covered, and now your sin is gone. Jesus is the greater goat, as it were. The book of uh, Hebrews, chapter 9, puts it this way. Speaking of the Day of Atonement, here's what it says about the Day of Atonement. It says, now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. They never stop. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself in the sins uh, of the people committed in ignorance. So the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies one time a year, but this happened constantly. But when you get to verse 11 of Hebrews 9, it says, But when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not the one of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. This is the amazing work of Christ. What did he do on Yom Kippur, the ultimate Yom Kippur? He gave his life as high priest, the perfect high priest, and he gave himself as the perfect substitutionary atonement, not a lamb in this instance, but the goat. You have to ask yourself, you're one of two ways. Everybody is. You're either covered by the blood of Christ and he's released you from your sin and positionally he sees you holy or you're not covered and your sins are your own. 
You're one or the other. The greatest thing that could happen to you at this Christmas would be to receive the gift of the sacrifice of the priest who died for you, Christ. But still many in our culture say, that is so narrow. That seems like there's just one way. Uh, Oprah Winfrey uh, said once, of people that think like that, I believe that there are many paths to God, uh, or there's many paths to the light. She says, I, I, don't, I don't believe there's only one way. There couldn't possibly be just one way to God. There couldn't possibly be with the millions of people in the world. She says, doesn't God care about your heart, or does God just care that you call his son Jesus? Answer to the questions. <laughs> Uh, God matters greatly to him about protocol. His son came and died as the high priest, as the sacrifice. It matters greatly how you look at him. Only he can save. What would the Yom Kippur uh, metaphor say? There is indeed only one way into God's presence, and it's his designed way for sinners to get cleansed. And only Christ can cleanse. Are you cleansed? Is your sin atoned for? Let's pray. Father God, uh, we pray that anyone among us that doesn't know you might find a counselor uh, off the side of the stage after church today and say, hey, I, I want my sin covered by Christ. That's why he came. That's why he died. Uh, that's why he rose again. And may they come to find you as their Savior and Lord. Uh, and may their atonement day begin today. And Lord, we look at the great sacrifice you've given and all of what you've done for us, leaving the glory of heaven uh, to go to the cross for our sin, to fulfill the typology of Yom Kippur to the fullest, we thank you for what you've done for us. And out of adoration for who you are, we give back to you our tithes and offerings, which is just a worthy part of our worship of who you are. Amen.